John chapter 6, verses 41 through 59, that we turn our attention. We always want to hear from God. This is how God speaks to us, as through His Word. And this is where we left off a few weeks ago. Let me just say, um, last week I was here. I, we were on vacation. Last week I was here. It is always a privilege to come here. Uh, somebody asked, is it weird to be here and not be preaching? And the answer is no. Absolutely not. I love, I love being a part of the people of God. I love being a part of this church family. And, uh, and hearing God's word proclaimed. It's not, I hear it proclaimed, it's only when I'm proclaiming it <laughs> on Sunday morning. So just a thanks to, to Pastor Her, Pastor Nathan, uh, just a thanks that they open up God's truth faithfully, don't they? Just really appreciate them, yeah. All right, John chapter uh, 6, and um, as you're turning there, let me begin with this statement. This statement, the most important message and the most vital truth to your life both now and into eternity, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of reconciliation with your creator. That there is forgiveness of sin, sin that you have personally committed, whether you realize it or not, but personally committed against an infinitely holy and glorious and just God. That there is a God who not only forgives, but also declares a sinner to be righteous. That there is eternal hope, there is eternal life with this saving God, perfect and never-ending future joy. This is the greatest and most vital truth out there. That this salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. And every other message pales in comparison. Now, if you're here and you have never come to Jesus in saving faith, this is the gospel you need to embrace and believe and trust. Jesus is the Savior you need to bow down before. Acknowledging your sinfulness before Him recognizing Christ's greatness, turning from your sin in godly sorrow, and resting in Jesus, his perfect life, his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection, alone for your acceptance by the Father. So if you're an unbeliever here, I'm glad you're here this morning. You are about to hear the glorious, the greatest news out there. And you'll hear this over the next few weeks, so come back to hear this. But if if you are here and you have already believed this gospel, please understand this. This greatest of news is not something you ever move on from. The gospel of Jesus is not something that only grants conversion to the sinner, As if the gospel of Jesus is exhausted once we come to Jesus in saving faith. That the purpose of the gospel is only to bring us justification. That declaration of righteousness and forgiveness. As if the gospel is a mere elementary truth for only the baby Christian. No, for the believer. It is the gospel of Christ that also sanctifies us. And matures us and grows us and energizes our obedience and confronts our pride and convicts our rebellion daily, daily. Let me read a quote by Milton Vincent. Uh, This book is for sale actually at the Resource Center uh, this morning, but he writes this so insightful. There is a costly mistake made by Christians who view the gospel as something that has fully served out its purpose the moment they believed in Jesus for salvation. Not knowing what to do with the gospel once they are saved, they lay it aside soon after conversion so they can move on to the bigger and better things, even scriptural things. Of course, none of us thinks this is what we are doing at the time, yet after many years of floundering in defeat, we can look back and see that is exactly what we have done. 
God did not give us his gospel so that we would embrace it and be converted. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? Actually, he offers it to us every day as a gift that keeps on giving to us everything we need for life and godliness. The wise believer learns this truth early and becomes proficient in extracting available benefits from the gospel each day. We extract these benefits by being absorbed in the gospel, speaking it to ourselves when necessary, and by daring to reckon it true in all we do. And then the statement. In fact, if Christians would do more preaching the gospel to themselves every day, non-Christians might have less trouble comprehending its message. For they would see its truth and power exuding from believers in indisputable ways. Let me summarize it this way. The gospel of Jesus is not only for the unbeliever. It's for the believer. It is just as vital for the Christian. The gospel of Jesus is not only evangelistic, it's also sanctifying. And the axiom is this. We'll see this worked out as we apply this text in John 6 over the next few weeks. But the axiom is this. The more you embrace the gospel of Jesus daily, the more you grow in your love for the gospel daily, the more you remind yourself of it daily, the more you believe it daily, the more you make choices according to the gospel daily, the more like Christ you will become. The more you will be humbled by God's grace, the more praise you will offer your Savior and Lord, the deeper your worship will be. The more your pride will be broken, the more the shimmer of this world will fade, the more your longing for eternal glory will grow, the greater your testimony with the unbeliever will be. The gospel of Jesus is the most important message, the most vital truth, not only to reconcile the unbeliever with the Father, but also to sanctify the believer into the image of Jesus. And so it's a joy to turn to John 6 because here Jesus, Jesus summarizes this very gospel. And interestingly enough, he summarizes it for these two very purposes. For the massive crowd out there that surrounded Jesus, upwards of 20,000 people, Jesus proclaims this message of salvation for their conversion. So that they would come to him in saving faith. So that they would be convicted of their sin for the first time. And believe that he is the bread of life. That's his message. He's the exclusive savior from sin. But remember, the crowd is not the only ones who will hear Jesus' words, right? No, Jesus' own disciples are listening too. And this message, this gospel summary is also for them. It's meant to further their faith, to grow them, to humble them, to stir their love and faithfulness to Christ even more, to energize their commitment further. Look at verse 68. It's what we see happen Peter speaks for the twelve. What does he say? Lord, to whom shall we go? Why would we ever leave you? You have the words of eternal life. That's the gospel. You have the true gospel. And so we're staying with you, Jesus. The crowd is leaving, but we're staying with you. We're committed to you, to you alone. The gospel converts. The gospel also sanctifies. Now, let's read the text, 41 through 59. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How 
does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, it has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. You have here the entire gospel summarized. The entire gospel summarized by the very author of the gospel himself. Let's unpack it this way, seven pillars of the gospel, seven pillars of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we'll draw application as we go. Pillar number one, we'll focus here this morning. Pillar number one, the pervasive sinfulness of fallen man, the pervasive sinfulness of fallen man. Notice how the passage begins in verse 41, therefore the Jews were grumbling about him. This is surprising. We know what happened the day before with this very crowd. The day before, Jesus miraculously fed these people, 20,000 of them. He fed them. And not just fed them with some token meal, he satisfied their hunger as never before. Verse 11 tells us the crowd ate as much as they wanted. This is a buffet from Jesus. He gives them a lavish banquet. Verse 12 says they were filled. Translate it this way. They were satisfied. No one's asking for more. No one is wishing that the bread was better. Verse 14 calls this a sign. It's a picture of a greater reality. Jesus here has given this crowd an up-close and personal picture of his coming kingdom. The Old Testament describes it as a banquet meal that's coming. He's shown himself to be the coming and greatest prophet prophesied in the Old Testament. But then even further, even more than this miracle, the crowd knows something has happened to Jesus. He left the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, came to Capernaum, but they don't know how he got there. He didn't pass through them. He didn't take any boat. They know something happened in a supernatural way. 
They don't know what, but they know it's supernatural. It's verses 22 through 25. And so this crowd now has been confronted with the divine Son of God. They've witnessed His works, the very works the Father had given Him to do. They saw the miracles. These were God the Father's testimony that Jesus is His Son, who Jesus claimed to be. In fact, look back at verse 26 just for a moment. Verse 26 Jesus says, truly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, signs in the plural. You saw them more than one miracle. At this point in Jesus' ministry, there have been thousands of healings. Hundreds of demons have been cast out. Miracles have been performed in abundance. The dead have been raised. And people in this crowd have witnessed many of these miracles. They know their Old Testament. They know Old Testament prophecy. Again, another confirmation, Jesus is the Son. John the Baptist's testimony is rung throughout the land. Another testimony of who Jesus is. And according to the Old Testament, the very law to which they prescribed, on the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. So this crowd has had the highest legal requirement fulfilled right in front of them. They've experienced it. Back to verse 41. What is their response? They're grumbling. They're grumbling. An angry murmur. So it would be mutterings of opposition spreading through the crowd. Today it would be equivalent of you standing up and booing me, the speaker. Don't do it, but that's the equivalent, right? So just booing the speaker. Drop down to verse 52. The Jews began to argue with one another, and so their anger's building. They're disgusted with Jesus. They only feel contempt for him. Now, if you know your Old Testament history, when you read this word grumble, it reminds you of a group, doesn't it? The Old Testament? Grumbling. That was Israel's response to Moses, right? After they too, that group, they too experienced firsthand a supernatural miracle from God. God delivered Israel from Egyptian slavery miraculously. And what what do we read? The whole... Congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled, same word, grumbled against Moses. In verse 7, it's a complaint described as grumblings against Yahweh. Exodus 17, they grumbled against Moses. Numbers 14, all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, the whole congregation. Well, now thousands of years later, what do we see? Nothing has changed in Israel. Fallen man is born with a depraved heart. And now Israel continues to grumble against Yahweh. This time, they're showing their disgust, not against Moses, even further now against God's eternal Son. This is a condition, this is the condition of every fallen heart before salvation. Though face to face with the Son incarnate, though hearing the voice of their creator, though having experienced supernatural power like no crowd in the history of the world, they reject Jesus. John chapter 1 has set the stage for this. And listen to the amazement in John's words here. John 1.10, he was in the world, Christ. He was in the world and the world was made through him. He's the creator and he's in the world. And the world did not know him. How's that possible? 
verse 12, uh, verse 11, he came to his own. And those who were, who were his own did not receive him. They don't want anything to do with him. He's their creator. He's their redeemer. He's their Messiah. Yet they reject Jesus. They do not recognize his identity. They are blind to his person. They are deaf to his words. They hate his claims. Again, this is the condition of every person the moment they enter this world. Look at verse 41 again. They were grumbling because, because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They hear Jesus' words with their physical ears, yes, but their spiritual ears were closed. I am the bread that came down out of heaven. That's an amazing claim. It's an amazing claim. Jesus uses the divine name of Yahweh, God, I am. He couples it with only what Yahweh can do, give this bread of life. He's drawing off of the promise in Isaiah 55 that if you're thirsty, you come to the waters. If you have no money, no money, no righteousness, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? Why are you satisfied with everything else? Why do you spend your wages for what does not satisfy? And then Yahweh says this, listen carefully to me. To me, come to me. I'm the bread of life. Christ saying, I'm the bread of life. I satisfy. It's an amazing claim. And then he couples that claim with a claim of eternality, pre-existence. He says this, I'm the bread of life, but I've come down out of heaven. He's claiming to have existed before he was born in Bethlehem. I existed before that. I was sent. I wasn't born. I was sent. Sent by none less than God the Father. This is incarnation language. I've come down. Possess an attribute of God alone, pre-existence, eternality. I am God in human flesh. High claims, high claims. But remember, these claims were confirmed. He's not just saying something about himself. He's confirmed this already. He's confirmed this by his miracle-working power. He's confirmed this through fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It's been confirmed by John the Baptist, sent by God as the prophet, the forerunner. All these confirmations experienced by this very crowd. Go back to verse 41. They grumble. I hate this. They're offended by Jesus. They hate their creator. And note here, their complaint against Jesus is not based upon principle. It's not a complaint based upon some religious piety. They're not saying you're stealing glory from the Father, therefore we reject you, no. They reject Jesus because he refuses to give them what they want. They want temporal bread. Give us more bread. That was the call. Give us more bread. They don't mind coming to Jesus as a temporal bread giver. That's okay. They don't, don't mind receiving things from Jesus. They'll take that all day long. The problem here is that they do not see their need for salvation from sin. They don't see it. They're not prizing reconciliation with their Creator. In fact, they see themselves as not even needing Jesus' salvation. They don't need his flesh. We'll look at that in the next few weeks. They don't need his flesh. They don't need his life. They don't need him. 
like Nicodemus in chapter 3, they think that they already are citizens of the kingdom. They're blinded by their selfishness, blinded by their self-righteousness and pride. It's obvious to us, Jesus is no mere man. They've witnessed that firsthand. But here's the conclusion they can come up with. In their sin, blinded by their sin, here's what they can say. Look at verse 42. Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph? You have a direct rejection of what Jesus said in chapter 5. He claims to be the son of God. Here, they're saying he's not the son of God. He's the son of a man. He's the son of Joseph, whose, watch, whose father and mother we know. We know his family. You know, his heritage, despite all the evidence we've seen over the last just 12 hours, that's it, all the evidence, Jesus is only a mere man. Well, that's just sinfully foolish, right? Because they're coming to him saying, we want another meal, do something supernatural. So obviously, he's more than a mere man, but this is what they're saying. This is just the foolishness of rejecting Jesus. And then they just dismiss him. Look at verse 42. Again, how? They're irritated. How does he, how can this mere man now say, we've seen him grow up for years, we've seen him walk among us for three decades, and now he has the audacity to say, I've come down out of heaven? That's their conclusion. Despite all the evidence against it, that's their conclusion. Here's the question. Why? Why? How can this be? How can all of Jesus' miracles so easily be dismissed? How can the creature thumb his nose in the face of their creator? It's the same question today. Why do so many reject the glorious gospel, the most vital truth? How can this crowd do this? Well, Jesus has already answered that question. He's about to tell this crowd, but he's already answered the question. We'll look at this in a moment, but here's Jesus' answer. This crowd rejects him because every person enters this world spiritually dead in their sin. Every one of them. No one, as they enter this world, has eyes to see the glory of God. No one. No one has ears to hear the call of God. No one has a heart to love God. We've already heard this. Look back to John chapter 3. Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, John 3, 3, remember what he said here, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, literally born from above, unless a supernatural miracle happens to you, unless new life is given to you, he cannot see. Forget about entering the kingdom. You can't even see it. You cannot see the kingdom of God. You don't even realize that you need the kingdom of God. These are spiritually blind eyes. Look at verse 19 of John 3. From blind eyes to now a sin-loving heart. Verse 19, they love darkness. They love it. The unbeliever loves darkness rather than light. That's why they're not coming to Christ, receiving Him. They love their sin, verse 20, and do not come to the light. Why? For fear. They love their sin. They're afraid of something, afraid that their deeds will be exposed. John chapter 5, verse 25, Jesus calls every unbeliever dead, spiritually dead. 
They need a spiritual resurrection. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 34. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Bound by sin. Unable to break sin's shackles. Unable to unlock sin's chains. Couple that with what Jesus said in John 3. That man hates the light. He loves his sin. The unbeliever does not even want to escape sin's slavery. And this sinfulness is so pervasive. It burrows down as deep as possible into man's very nature. Look at chapter 8, verse 43. Jesus asks the question, why? Why do you not understand what I am saying? Why do you reject my words, my claims? Jesus knows why. Here's his answer. It is because you, what's the next word? Cannot. Cannot. Udunastai. You do not have the ability. You do not have the power. You do not have the capability to hear my words. You cannot hear my word. It's more than not wanting to hear Jesus' words. Every unbeliever is incapable of hearing the claims of Jesus rightly. And why is this so? Why? Because, verse 44, our nature is corrupt. You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. Men and women reject Christ because they are children of Satan. That's this crowd in John chapter 6. They're the physical descendants of Abraham. They're the spiritual children of Satan. This is the pervasive sinfulness of the unbelieving heart. Sin has corrupted every faculty we have. Every faculty. It has rendered us spiritually dead to the things of God. From the eyes, to the ears, to the heart, to our very nature. Back to John chapter 6. This is why this crowd rejects Jesus. After so much evidence has been given to them, you cannot evidence someone into saving faith. You can't do it. If anyone could do it, it's Jesus. He can't do it. It's not how this works. Which is why Jesus responds to them the way he does. Look at verse 43. Jesus answered and said to them, let me just give you one more miracle and then maybe you'll believe. Or let me just do one more act of kindness for you. Maybe then you'll like me. Come to me. Verse 43. Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. Jesus takes the very posture of Yahweh himself in the Old Testament with grumbling Israel. And he commands this grumbling crowd, stop your grumbling now. Quiet your mouths. That's the command. It's exposing their sinfulness to them. Stop the charade. Stop acting as if I haven't done enough for you. As if you need more evidence to believe I am who I claim to be. Look at verse 30. Notice what they say in verse 30. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? The problem is not us, it's you. You haven't given us enough evidence. Stop your grumbling. Stop acting as if the reason for your unbelief is some deficiency in me. It's not. It's in you. 
problem resides in the innermost being of your nature. Which is why Jesus says what he does in verse 44. Just watch this. Let this sink in here. Verse 44. No one. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come. This is true of every single person. No exceptions. Can come. Dunamai is able to come. This refers to power and capability, even potential. No one, no one has the ability. No one possesses the capability or even the potential to come to me, Jesus says to turn in repentance from sin, to turn in saving faith to Christ. That is an impossible task. You can't do it. Sin is so pervasive, it has also affected man's will. Man's will. Now, where's Jesus getting this from? Just making it up? No, this is Old Testament teaching. Genesis chapter 6, the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every intent, only evil, all the time. That's why no one can come. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart, the mission control center of your life, the heart is more deceitful than all else, desperately sick. Who can understand it? It's a heart issue. Psalm 14, there's no one who does good. Yahweh has looked down. He's seen everyone. His conclusion is this, everyone has turned aside. No one does good. No one even seeks him. Jeremiah 13, 23 puts this in very picturesque language. Can an Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then you also can do good. The greatest good being turning to Christ. Then you also can do good who are accustomed to doing evil. Here's how impossible it is to come to Christ. It is as impossible as a leopard deciding to look like a zebra. That's the problem. A leopard saying, I'm going to trade my spots for stripes. That's what I'm going to do. It doesn't happen. And amazingly, this is Jesus' message for this crowd. Stop grumbling. You have no will to come to me. This is so counterintuitive to today's thinking, right? I mean, no doubt, some of us are reading this going, Jesus, what are you doing here? What are you doing Today's gospel call treats coming to Jesus as something anyone can do. As if believing the claims of Jesus is the easiest thing to do. This is why I've entitled the first pillar of the gospel, the pervasive sinfulness of fallen man. Because according to Jesus, sin has affected man utterly and thoroughly. Sin has permeated our entire being to our very will. And this is where saving faith begins. Acknowledging our utter and thorough sinfulness. You cannot come to Christ in saving faith unless you concede your complete inability and radical depravity before the Holy One. But mark this, recalling our utter depravity is also where a life of sanctification begins. Remembering who you were before the Father drew you is essential now, if you're a believer, essential now for your obedience to Christ after he saved you. So often I think this stems from our self-esteem culture At the very least, it stems from our pride, our love of self, 
So often the thought is this, once you're forgiven of your sins, you should never think about who you are before Christ. You're a new creature, new creature. I'm never going to think about that old creature again. It's far from what we see the scriptures teach. In fact, that kind of thinking is detrimental to your sanctification. In your bulletin, you have a handout here, and it recalls who we were before, before we are drawn to the Father, who we were. I've given you this so you can take it on the back of your bulletin. You'll see some application questions, some application points. One of those is pray through this, read through this, apply this to you. What you see in Romans 11, verses 30 through 36, is that Paul re recalls our depravity before God draws us in grace. He recalls our depravity. Why? Because understanding that is the key for worship and praise. In Ephesians 2, Paul's logic is this, remembering your former condition and God's sovereign and completely undeserved mercy actually grows your hatred for sin. It energizes your obedience to walk in good works. Colossians 3, remembering our form of sinfulness leads to humility and unity. In Titus 3, we see recalling our former depravity creates in us a loving compassion for the lost. We remember our depraved state. No one could come. We could not come. It was impossible. Guess what? That breaks any air of religious pride or superiority that we might have toward the unbeliever. Why? Because we were once like them, but for God's grace. Romans 5 Paul recalls our former depravity, says that we were enemies of God in order to energize our assurance of salvation. Verse 10, if while we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, if God saved us when we were totally depraved, much more having been reconciled, now that we are his, now that we've been redeemed, we shall be saved by his life. Paul's point is this, if Christ did not turn his back on us in our total depraved state, do you think he's going to turn his back on you now that you are his? It's not going to happen. More examples can be given here. Again, to quote Vincent, such an awareness of my sinfulness does not drag me down but actually serves to lift me up. It's so counterintuitive. It serves to lift me up by magnifying my appreciation of God's forgiving grace in my life. Recalling our depravity magnifies Him, His grace. It humbles us. The more I appreciate the magnitude of God's forgiveness of my sins, the more I love him and delight to show him love through heartfelt expressions of worship. Please do not think that once you are saved from your sin, you are to move on to the bigger and better things. Now, the gospel is to be in our minds daily, beginning with this first pillar of the gospel, the pervasive sinfulness a fallen man, since not only acknowledging our sinfulness is where saving faith begins, but recalling it often, recalling our former depravity, not to wallow in it, but to exalt God's grace, that is how obedience to Christ continues. Let me conclude with this. If this is where Jesus ended, there would be no gospel. That no one can come, no gospel. 
He said in verse 44, all are inherently evil, we're incapable. So at this point, there's no hope, there's no salvation. This would not be the greatest news in the world, this is the worst news in the world. But he continues to the second pillar of the gospel where we'll pick it up next week. Pillar number two, the sovereign love of a gracious father. The sovereign love of a gracious father. Those who are children of wrath, children of the devil, what can happen to them if God chooses? Verse 44, the father draws. The father draws. Here's the hope. The hope is a sovereign and gracious father to act, to work, to shatter the will's slavery to sin, to enlighten the spiritually blind eyes to the glory of of Jesus. In a word, the Father draws the sinner to himself. If you have come to Christ in saving faith, you are a miracle of grace, a miracle of grace. He has drawn you despite yourself. We'll pick it up there next week. Father, I pray that already you have humbled us before your grace, love, and mercy. I pray, Father, that for those who have never come to you in saving faith, you would draw them. That your spirit would change their heart, grant them eyes to see not only their sinfulness, but the glory of Jesus' perfection. And that you would sanctify us through your gospel. That we would remind ourselves daily of this great truth, most vital truth that we'd be humbled by it and energized unto obedience. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.